So to begin, I will acknowledge I'm coming to you from Ngambri and Ngunnawal lands of Canberra and I acknowledge all First Nations people who are attending today. Thank you, Sam Kirkpatrick, um, for being here today to present uh, on the unknown to known interpreting cultural difference through Walpuri, Murakulu and Indonesian Pancasila. Um, and thank you for presenting this seminar to um, the study group of music and dance of Oceania, part of the ICTM. Uh, so Sam has research interests which span issues of music, culture and theology with a specific focus given to Indigenous Australian song and philosophical issues of land and identity. Sam is currently a research associate at the Indigenous Knowledge Institute, University of Melbourne, and leading a University of Divinity research project on Yolngu and Walpuri epistemology. Sam completed a doctorate in ethnomusicology at the National Centre for Indigenous Studies, as well as a postgraduate research on Terry Eagleton's critical method and irony within Christian faith. Um, Sam's co-authors on this paper are, um, are two people. Firstly, Wanda Jumpy Jumper Powell, who is a fully initiated Walpuri um, law man um, who was admitted into the highest order of traditional leadership by Walpuri elders. In 1980s, he graduated uh, from the Kankalu Walpuri Sky Ceremonies, uh, which give him responsibility to look after his father's and his mother's father's song lines. In addition to being custodian of these ceremonies and country, he is the guardian of his father's mother and mother's mother's song lines. Wanda's homeland is Pau, and he also has the responsibility to look after a remote dreaming plane known as Kulpalunu along the rain, rain dreaming. Uh, he's a senior male of his clan and represents them within the broader Kuruji Corporation. Uh, and he's a highly sought after public speaker and cultural advisor and has directed the Milpuri Festival, um, which uh, there's other films as well, but um, he's directed Milpuri Winds of Change, which you can find on SBS on demand. And he holds a long-term research collaboration with colleagues at the University of Melbourne in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Faculty and Fine Arts and Music and Faculty of Science, as well as with academics at other universities around the world. And the other co-presenter is Harry Susanto, who's a lecturer in Hebrew scripture and principal of the Sekola Tinggi Theologi Jemat Christus Indonesia, Churches of Christ Theological College Indonesia in Zalatiga, central Java. Harry has overseen theological and ministry formation within Gereja Jemat Christus Indonesia and engaged with students and communities from Arche to Papua. Harry is a regular guest in forums and teaching through Stirling Theological College, University of Divinity. And thank you, Sam, for coming along to present on behalf of um, all your authors today. Okay, yeah, <laughs> um, just, just to give you a little bit of sense of the context of where this is coming out of, um, uh, myself and a few others have, have just finished a 16-month project at the University of Divinity, uh, looking at um, uh, building from a lot of the work that's been done in ethnomusicology around uh, relationality and the ways that um, uh, various knowledge systems are embedded within uh, relational contexts and, and the ways that those kinship connections and connections to country actually constitute knowledge um, and and embed that within specific uh, coordinates. So um, we've been looking at how that relates to epistemology and, and the ways that we understand or develop collaborative understanding um, across culture. So Wanda, as you as you probably would know, would be is, is has been fantastic um, in that space. Um, also his lesser known um, within this forum, lesser known um, work in, in Christian theology, and he's actually involved with a, a group called Australians Together and um, developing leadership programs for Aboriginal Christian leaders across Australia. Um, and Harry is someone who I've connected with in many uh, 
many ways over the last 15 years as well. And so this paper, we, we've been looking for ways into a, um, a way of building a, well, not building a methodology, but exploring what, what these, um, what might be productive ways of approaching conversations across contexts like Walpuri, Indonesia, non-Indigenous um, contexts, which actually to want to don't seem that odd to be working across those differences. Um, so we we may not quite get as far as talking about religious pluralism in Indonesia, um, but hopefully you'll pick up some hints of, of where this is going um, along the way. I think the focus on song is is probably more interest um, for now anyway. So um, I'm going to read most of this paper just to keep things things moving and on track. But I'll begin with a question. What is the significance of Indigenous Australian song and narrative traditions for the ways we might work together with those who are different within our increasingly interconnected global region? In what follows, we respond to this question heuristically through the interpretive approaches of Walpuri narrative and thought. We consider this undertaking worthwhile in that it generates engagement across identifiable cultural differences from Australia to Indonesia, and in anticipation of new layers of understanding and relational growth. A few years ago, I coordinated and co-taught the Theology Unit Culture and Country, Engaging Faith in Contemporary Australian Society at the University of Divinity. And this unit encompassed issues of indigeneity, multiculturalism and secularity, as well as religion and the state ideology of Pancasila in Indonesia. And the content was delivered by myself uh, and Indonesian academic Harry Sasanto. It was by coincidence that Sasanto introduced Pancasila, the foundational ideology of the Republic of Indonesia, directly after Wanta, uh, the video of Wanta's um, introduction to Murakulu, a, a principle that translates as home having or a pattern for working together in our differences uh, that extends from his own ancestral narratives. Structurally, the similarities were striking. Panchasila and Murakulu both contained five principles considered necessary to the embodiment of unity in diversity and the flourishing of society through the cooperation of diverse people. Sometime later, I was talking with Wanta about this, and he affirmed more than a superficial connection, commenting that Panchasila is Indonesia's own Murakulu. I believe everyone has their own version of Murakulu. Wanta's observation is multiply significant and extends an intellectual tradition that understands relations between different people, homeland and languages through kuruwari, the, the marks or patterns of ancestral creation. Kuruwari can be read in the movements of hot and cold air to produce clouds and rain, the rotation of the stars, the flight of budrigars, the call of the emu and the nurture of a child by her mother. To learn and interpret these marks or designs is to understand patterns of connections between people and place and the ways we are bound together as an interconnected body. In affirming Panchasila as Indonesia's own Murakulu, Wanta seeks understanding, uh, he seeks to understand social identity as emergent through many constituent parts and the interactions of diverse peoples and places. This resonates with the ethos of Panchasila as expressed in the Indonesian national motto, Bineka Tungau Ika, unity in diversity, and traditional Javanese wisdom of Gotaroyo, mutual assistance. And through the paradigm of Murakulu, those things which mark our differences become a means to share with others and form communities that are responsive and responsible. You're all no doubt aware that um, various traditions of thought and performance across Aboriginal Australia uphold a vitalising discourse of difference 
as a potential for mutual growth. Distinct identities are strengthened and sustained through ceremonial performances that celebrate ancestral narratives and homelands as, quote, an ornate patchwork of myriad different countries, that's Aaron Corn and Marcia Langton, and which enable relational interdependencies between groups. While songs, dances, and designs express hereditary rights to these homelands, they are also relate complex associations between the original ancestors and their journeys through the land. The convergences and divergences of ancestors' activities and tracks shape responsibilities between groups, as in the management of hereditary estates or related kins, obligations of marriage of soul, trade, political processes. This is familiar territory. Um, Morphe and Morphe have utilised, that's Harlan Francis, <laughs> have utilised the term relative autonomy in various ways to describe such independencies. Relative autonomy can also describe how you will work with non-Indigenous peoples and cultures in the sense that people can create new institutions that face in two directions, inwards to their world of difference and outwards from it. That is, new practices are formed through the gener generative relations of those who are different and they sustain autonomous ancestral identities. Morgan Brigg and Mary Graham in Queensland have explored similar dynamics through the term autonomous regard. They assert, quote, the most consistent feature of Aboriginal political ordering and philosophy is thoroughgoing attentiveness to relations and thus to the patterns of ethical obligations and contingencies that arise within those relations. These somewhat technical formulations are conveyed through generative metaphors, such as the intermingling of salt water and fresh water, the intimate familial difference between child and mother, or milpuri, the convergence of hot and cold pressure systems to produce thunderclouds. These metaphors have shaped our approach to Morakulu and Panchasila as independent systems that might give taste to one another. Give taste is a phrase also borrowed from Howard and Francis Morphy in detailing ownership of sea and waterways around Blue Mud Bay. During the dry season, salt seeps up the freshwater systems from the coast. During the wet, the heavy rains push freshwater out into the sea. While there is dynamic confluence, bodies of sea and flood water remain conceptually separate. And they write, the apparent dualism imposed by the contrast salt versus fresh fails to capture the complexity of the environmental, ecological and mythological relationship between the two. There is a mediating state in the dynamic interrelationship between salt and fresh water, which is brackish water. This is a potent source of metaphor in your thought. Recently, uh, Wanta was in Melbourne and we were sitting in a cafe reflecting on the responsibility of holding tightly to ancestral stories, even as those stories give us ways of working with others. And Murakulu is concerned with precisely this, the ways that our identities, quote, shine out as a gift to others. Uh, that's your Murakulu, that's your character, says Wanta. Paul, uh, sorry, Paul, Wanta had just added honey to his tea. And I commented that the identity of one complemented and enhanced the identity or flavor of the other. However, it wouldn't work so well if we mixed tea with orange juice. The point, Wanta responded, is not to mix everything together in one lukewarm brew. Rather, it is the differential which is enjoyed, the sweet tannin flavor of the tea alternating with the citrus zing of the juice. And in this way, we should appreciate differences which help us understand what is unique, but also which nourishes us in a variety of ways. And, and so in relation to different people, uh, peoples and cultures, Murakulu is how, uh, in Wanta's words, you give yourself to others and they give back to you in a way trying to honor you and respect you. You might be orange juice, you might be a cup of tea, you might be the sky, you might be the ground, it doesn't matter. Try not to mix them because we like it separate. And in that way, we will always continue to feed off each other. 
So we've been exploring how this paradigm relates not only to hermeneutics or patterns of interpretation and narrative, but also the ways that these open ways of, of engaging across differences as between Walpuri um, and, and Panchasila in Indonesia, how our differences give taste to one another. I'm gonna play a, a refrain here. I'm gonna play a little video of that trip to Melbourne, which was just at the end of last year, I think in November or December. Um, and want uh, a little take on Muruqul in Melbourne. Can I find you all again? Here you are. Hello, my name is Wanda Jambinba. I'm in Melbourne in Carlton. I could sing the Carlton song, but no, not enough time. But today, I'm trying to explain the, using the two drinks here, uh, about Ngodokulu. I'm mixing honey to the tea. I've just finished the orange juice. Now, why didn't I mi mix the orange juice with the tea? It's because I want them to be separate. In that way, Muragol is like that. Yeah, always be a kid separate. Try not to mix the orange with the tea. Too much integration will just rob you of your identity. I come from a Walpuri language group, and we got two skin groups, but uh, cut in two. They're, they're divided. Moities, I think the anthropologists call them. My sons and my father, they are the sky moiti, even my wife. Mine is an earth moiti, and so I had to marry a cross. That is the drinking. The earth and the sky, they're the two containers. Muragulu is a way to uh, your identity have to shine out. You as an individual, so that's your Muragulu. That's your character. It's a way people see you, reminds them of you always. Yeah, and you, you give yourself to them. They give back to you in a way, trying to honor you and respect you. You might be orange juice, you might be a cup of tea. It doesn't matter. Try not to mix them because we like it separate and we'll always continue to feed off each other by drinking the 2T, either being a sky or either being the earth. Murakulu. Just coming to Melbourne, yeah? I had a trouble identifying my bag. I, I must put my Murakulu in it. Yeah. So next time, it doesn't pass me on the conveyor three or four times, because they look the same, all the bags look the same. Yeah, I can just spot my Ngurogulu with the sun. That's Ngurogulu too. Identity, Ngurogulu. That's my place amongst all others. Yeah, the Ngurogulu, yeah, you carry it, but it also carry you. That's a very classic Wanta inversion at the end. That's your little call of it. It's your identity. Oh, hey. Going on to the next uh, next video in that project. Um, so, Laura Kulu, um, I'd like to introduce this a little bit more. Um, Wanta has taught about this a lot, and uh, you'll find lots of work of his on this. Um, um, but uh, Laura Kulu, 
literally meaning home having, is a pattern of working together and understanding one another and our differences. Uh, belonging and purpose are discovered through the performance of songs and dances, whose narratives are represented by the distinct designs, kuruari, laws and marks bestowed as birthright within ancestral law. Yet more than affirming separate identities, Murakul shows how different families and homelands are woven together within greater narrative constellation. Uh, for one time, Murakul also gives impetus to engagement across diverse cultural and religious traditions. So you may have seen, I'm going to bring up a few diagrams here, but you may have seen um, Murakul as read from the Southern Cross uh, Okay, here we go. And this, so this pattern is read from the five stars of the Southern Cross, which represent five interrelated elements of Walker identity, land, law, ceremony, language, and kin. Healthy community depends on our active engagement with and contribution to the vitalization of these elements, which sustain our differences, yet underpin connection. Through Murakula, one has a home and identity that is distinct from, yet related to all others. So symbolically, Murakula represents aspirations for flourishing society that binds together all people. And it provides a structure for this to occur through kinship relations, the four cardinal directions that this constellation can represent are also um, mapped on to the different skin groups. And you can see here um, the eight, eight sections of Walfrey um, kinship relations um, mapping onto the Southern Cross. Uh, of course, the different narratives that each of those groups also bring um, at different parts of that compass, uh, this compass for navigating life uh, and and who we are. Wanta says everyone has to sing and learn about the particular kuruari that is their birthright, their country, identity and stories. And the old people will say, that's yours, keep it. Yes, they're revitalizing their birthright. It's not enough to know about your country. You have to understand how it fits in, how it's located as a place in the dreaming and in the song line. And so through activities such as looking after kin, caring for country, educating children, um, working out resolving conflicts and, and celebrating our ancestral stories in performance, Murakulu represents healthy and productive society. This has been the focus of Wanda's work through the Milbury Festival, um, but also the ways that he goes about his teaching uh, with non-Indigenous Australians as well, and, and you'll find various papers and things around that. Um, in this way, ceremony is concerned with growth. Getting back to your Murakulu, understanding how um, your birthright fits in and is located amongst others is about um, mutual growth and and um, and relationships. And, and Wanta says, you know the word culture, it's something to do with gardening. Et, 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 Etymologically, etymologically, actually, culture, um, cultivation. You can see the common root there. We have to be good gardeners of the country. Well, maybe, or maybe it's country that makes a garden out of us. This country is a real gardener. That's the system we need to be in. This country is telling people how you must behave to each other. It's written in the stars. That's Kuruari, and that's Murakulu. Um. So these relational dynamics of Murakulu might also be considered through a hermeneutic lens. That is how we go about interpreting stories and narratives. This is key to understanding Wanda's approach to teaching and leadership, which begins by asking why the ancestors caused certain things to be written into creation in the land, stars, animals, and people, and how different ancestral narratives relate to each other. These questions are asked with an openness to ethical formation, allowing responsibilities of nurture to be formed 
in the ways that distinct stories and Jukapa tracks um, co converge and diverge from one another. <clears throat> um, by focusing on the ways that song and stories are interpreted within Walpur tradition, we can better understand Wanta's claim that Panchasila is Indonesia's own Murakulu, an approach to understanding our place among others. For Wanta, the gathering of different family for ceremony is an important opportunity for educative development and the nurture of healthy communities, shaping responsibilities between kin groups uh, and the deeper understanding of the patterns of ancestral law. He has described the ways we learn and grow together through song as a movement from unknown to known. Through performances that have been passed down the generations, individuals discover their stories that are their birthright and how these might be, quote, a gift to others. Wanda says, sharing comes through your ceremony. It's a way of learning from each other. That's why we have Jariwampa. So everyone can learn from each other. Come into a group that's singing a song, you have to hold a shield or a boomerang over your head to show respect to that mob because you want to feed off them. So it's like coming to a dinner table. When you learn knowledge, you're actually feeding on it. The composition and performance of song is a process of figuring how narratives and their symbolic components constitute a relational, a relational economy a way of living among others that sustains life and creates abundance in the sense of productive cooperation, material sustenance, happiness through um, a stable configuration or relationships and a deep resonance of love and nurture. Uh, through ceremonial processes, an understanding of Nurukulu is gained through a richer and more complex layering of the connections that help us find out how it all fits together people, places, ecology, histories. And in Iwanta's words, finding out how the Walyajara, our ancestors were really intelligent people putting all this together. Because each ancestral theme or mark is regarded as partial, as one event or figure within an ornate patchwork, some lines are full of mysteries and give us questions to ask about ourselves and our connections with others. So I'll give you an example. And this, um, this uh, story is coming from Wanta's own um, group, Jumper Jumper group, and uh, it got to do with the ancestral emu, Kananandja. And Wanta describes how interpreting a mystery within this narrative helps Walpri to understand connections, their connection with Madhu people, whose land is around 400 kilometres to the west of Walpri country. Madhu people in Western, uh, I'm just going to read now um, Wanta's words and my words, that is just a dialogue. So Wanta, Madhu in Western Australia, they have a similar song to our Walpri songs. Even though some of these songs have the same storyline, they mention different things. We Walpri only tell of the emu being scared of something. That's about it. But if you look to those Madhu stories, there's a dog in there chasing the emu. So the Walpri story doesn't actually tell us that. Why is this important? Why did they come up with that, those ancestors? If that's the storyline, what's the reason behind it? They start the story in one song and they show where it is going in another group's song. And so, you know, we might we might see that there's an important connection here between Maru and Walpri that is kept alive through these stories. And the process of gathering for ceremony uh, and performing and remembering those songs is, is a pattern of questioning why these stories have been configured and retold in these ways, why certain details have been omitted, um, what is the relationship that might be formed through um, the obligations and responsibilities that this story brings about. And this has got to do uh, with, with what we've talked about as a as a trading route, which is not only for, for commercial goods or material goods, but um, has to do with the ways we exchange songs and ceremonies and interweave those connections to bind different groups together. Um, so 
Through a song, we're actually tracking connections between groups. To move from unknown to known is to understand a greater complexity of meaning laid into the stories that come to us as birthright. And through this interpretive process, also to know others and our relational interdependencies. Um, a, a good good way into this, there's a good book by Lee Cataldi. Um, actually, Georgie put me onto that. Um, and she writes about the ways that narratives are shaped by those gathered and those gathered draw on certain aspects or layers of a narrative to relate the connections between those who are present um, in what they're singing and, and, the, and the ways that that story is constructed and performed. So if Murakulu represents a way of understanding our home among others, what does this mean for Australia and its near neighbours to the north, Indonesia? How are we to learn about Indonesian people and culture through the interpretive approaches of Murakulu? Or, as Wanta asks, how does your Murakulu learn with that other Murakulu? So I'm going to spend maybe the last um, eight or nine minutes, perhaps, just introducing the Indonesian context, and, and hopefully you can see methodologically where this is going, because I'm really keen to hear your, your thoughts around that. Um, of course, this is not just a random exercise. There is an imperative to explore these connections within Warpery narrative. The rotation of the Southern Cross seen in the night skies in both Australia and Indonesia, as it is in South America and Africa, tell of the emu who pursued by dogs reaches the ocean and swims across the horizon. Where did he go before drowning and washing up again on the Kimberley coastline? How might this mystery prompt heuristic engagement across cultural difference? and generate new connections. Panchasila is a very interesting thing to work with. And anyone, I think, I mean, you, um, those of you who are involved with Papua New Guinea probably have encountered this maybe in relation to Timor and, and um, West Papua and things like that. Um, it's, it's a complex and um, contested concept within Indonesia. But it's it's um it's right throughout cultural culture um and also political life in Indonesia. I'll share my screen to give you an idea of what this is about. This is the Indonesian coat of arms, and it's showing the Pancasila, the five principles represented on the shield, and um. There's all sorts of um, histories here around um, uh, Panchasila being implemented uh, by President Suharto, uh, using Panchasila as a legit legitimation to 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 um, push down against minorities and, and communist groups, and um, complex histories around the genocide in the 1960s there. Um, so with all that in mind, um, it's also quite celebrated today and Indonesia has a Panchasila Day that um, Jakawi started about three or four years ago um, and very much celebrated um, for its capacity to um, uh, hold the diversity of Indonesia together in one nation. And so as the foundational ideology of the Republic of Indonesia, which was established in 1945, there is a similarity with Murakulu in that Panchasila is Pancha Five Sila principles um, considered necessary to a flourishing society. Essentially, these are commitments to belief in one God, humanity, unity, consensus, and social justice. In an archipelago nation that spans 17,000 islands from Aceh to Papua, encompassing 1,340 ethnic groups and over 800 spoken languages, Panchasila promotes tolerance between diverse religious, ethnic, and linguistic groups. Undergoing a recent resurgence of support, especially within civic education and social participation initiatives, Panchasila can also be considered a cultural and political program that aspires to bring about Bineka Tumal Ika, an ideal 
of unity in diversity proclaimed as the Indonesian national motto. The five principles of Pancasila might be translated like this. Number one is belief in one divinity, which emphasizes for Indonesians the importance of a religious identity um, to moral behavior and, and those sorts of things. Um, and that's represented by the, the star. A just and civilized humanity, recognizing the dignity of all, and that's the unbroken chain. The unity of Indonesia, and this is where it becomes interesting with places like West Papua, uh, a unity which begins in diversity. Democracy led by inner wisdom and deliberation, indicating the need for maturity in our negotiations, and that's the buffalo. And social justice, which looks after the weak and fosters capacity among all, and that's cotton and rice. A lot of these can be traced back to uh, traditional Javanese wisdom, central Javanese wisdom and, and indigenous traditions. Um, and by comparing constituent elements of Murakul and Panchasila, we might come to a deeper appreciation of these systems. For instance, the fourth principle, democracy led by inner wisdom and deliberation, relates to, it actually comes out of um, patterns of um, um, traditional village patterns in, in central Java for leadership and negotiation. Um, and that relates to Murakulu as a pattern of building consensus in which no one voice is more important than any other. However, overplaying these similarities, especially as they are depicted in representational forms, can seem naive. Uh, that there are five elements in both is arbitrary. For Indonesians, the five pillars of Islam provide an archetype. For Walpuri, the fourfold categorization of descent, mother's mother, mother's father, father's mother, father's father. So these are disparate cultural and religious trajectories. Further, Panchasila emerged through the formation of a modern nation state and aspirations to autonomy on an international stage. Murakulu is intimately tied to custodianship of hereditary estate, souls and stories. So if these two discourses represent disparate histories and perspectives, how might then we read them together meaningfully um, without, um, how, how might they give taste to one another and, and be conceptually separate? Um, so where we're going with this, um, so there can be lots of conflict over Panchasila in Indonesia, but basically religious minorities um, understand it to be uh, allowing pluralism. And so actually the secular government pr promotes Panchasila because it allows Christians, um, Hindus, Buddhists, it doesn't allow non-belief actually. Um, so there's a controversy there, but... Um, it creates this sense of ascriptive religion where, whereby every adult has to nominate a, a religious identity on their um, on their identity card. Now, that is good in some in in some ways, um, whether good or bad. That that allows space for pluralism, allows difference to exist, but it's only an authorized difference within the political setup. Um, and what, what that leads to is it means that religious identities are often tied to family tradition. So it's it's a sense of ascriptive identity. It's a sense that my parents um, were Muslim, so I'm Muslim. And so religious identities are tied to um, very cultural and, and traditional things. Even ethnic groups will identify, a whole ethnic group will identify with a particular religion. And so this can actually inadvertently um, ramp up conflict because um, you're actually dealing with social issues um, through religious identities. So like on Ambon, when there was um, civil civil violence and strife there in, in the mid uh, 2007, I think, um, it was actually issues around corruption within the civil service. But because certain occupations were identified with certain religions, it, it exacerbated and, and it sort of blew up along Christian Muslim lines. And so within this context, the challenge of Murakulu and what we can what, what we can draw from walk free um, thinking is that the markers of our identity, our kurawari, those ancestral identities and traditions, 
can't be things that entrench separation, but in Wanda's words, have to show us how to become a gift to others. And this is precisely what Gautam Roy on this mutual assistance, Javanese wisdom is all about. It's about, um, it's about the work that Harry is involved with um, in, in using church communities to build, um, build this sense of mutual assistance between neighbours um, in, in visiting the sick, in cleaning the streets, in, in um, building mosques, in developing agricultural businesses and things like that. And so um, there's this rich sense of Indonesian identity that emerges through these productive differences working together. Um, and the challenge is always, how do you not um, let them compartmentalise? And, and that is a, a hermeneutic challenge, uh, as we've seen with Mura Kula. So that's sort of where we're going with that. I know there's there's a lot there's a lot in there, and um, it's it's often it's often tricky to get to those more interesting um, points. I think toward the end, methodologically, um, but, but yeah, you can see that there's a lot of background that comes from the the different people that I've I've been working with that I've been seeking to bring together in a way, and hopefully that resonates with you in some way. So that's probably enough for me. You've you've been listening really well. There's a lot of words. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, that was really interesting. So fascinating to draw those different perspectives together. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have lots of questions from um from people. Please um either raise your hand or or yell out, whatever. Um, just unmute yourself and yell out if um if it's easier. Um, I might get started. Um, I was I was thinking while um thinking about your title from the unknown to the known and sort of thinking about the way Wanda, um, Wanda takes what's known to him as his way of, um, of engaging with cultural difference and interpreting the things that he um, encounters when he travels to different places or meets new people or, or, um, or you know, new philosophies like, like Panchasila. Um, and I'm just sort of, and this is sort of, I, I guess, a, a common way of, you know, getting used to that discomfort of being somewhere different or with something that you don't know is taking, taking, um, you know, taking those concepts that he does understand that make sense of his life and then taking them, taking them further out. So, I'm, I mean, I can get, get where you're going, but there's also like a kind of flip around, I guess, of your um title in, in that kind of uh, way. And I was wondering if, um, if you'd ever, like, does he talk about that, process um of using Murukulu in that way and, and has he um I mean have there been any discussions with Harry sort of around um engaging with the, that philosophy which might draw you know similar to the um honey and the tea thing has he um sort of spoken about incorporating those ideas from yeah, Indonesian yeah. philosophy as well I think you're right because um your your known your known <laughs> isn't that that um, Donald Rumsfeld thing? Your known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. <laughs> um, slightly wordy, but um, your those things you know do provide an aperture through which you experience an encounter. And I think for want to by celebrating and getting to know those things that have come to you. From the ancestors, your birthright, your particular stories. That is that is what you might call a gift, a way of engaging with others. And so there is that sense that you're actually consolidating or coming to know those birthrights in the way they allow you to engage with others. So it is both and. I think they're entwined, unknown and known, known and unknown. Um, I think the way I, I put it, um, is that difference allows you to consolidate your own identity and come to know that more. Your own identity also gives you a way of engaging difference. Um, that's my reading of it. Um, and, and I guess I guess it works in that um, Wander is comfortable working with my reading like that, <laughs> whether, whether he, he probably has different nuances and, and different um, different concerns, I think, uh, 
in terms of yeah and, and in indonesian context i mean one of the challenges uh one of the pervasive challenges of of religious minorities and i know um the christian story a little bit more but is is feeling comfortable to uh live with expressions of faith where there is conflict and hostility on a local level um things like bombings and all sorts of um all sorts of political conflict and things like that and so um i, I guess harry's response to that and and the sort of response he tries to encourage in his work is <clears throat> to use to use your own religious commitments as seasoning to others um we talk about rasa taste in the in indonesian hot pot <laughs> of many cultures what does your um what are your commitments more more so not what is your ancestral traditions but what are your commitments of faith how do they um how do they enhance the flavor of a, of a collective identity um and so that's where that relates i think that's where the giving taste thing has has come out of yeah yeah great um Yes, and I guess that's quite, um, I mean, from the well Pru perspective, it's quite sort of intrinsic to a uh, whole Jukurpa philosophy of being able to, um, you know, incorporate um, change and new things into that so so easily because yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, great. Is there anyone else um, with any, any questions? Um, I can't see Sally. Yep. Yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, thanks so much, Georgia, and thanks, Sam. That was really um, captivating. <laughs> um, I'd love to chat more, but I don't know. Um, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to pick up, like as you were speaking, um, I really uh, couldn't stop thinking about um, how the Jabara or Inu does mm. pop up in, in Kimberley or um, Wanjana Wungud um mythologies and 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 stories and how um how the behavior and actions of that emu um have uh been reflected upon in the context of um intercultural research i guess um and um and i just thought you know i just kind of feel like some of the <laughs> some of that reflection maybe relevant to this and could lead to more conversation but so yeah. that the like the Jebara um story for for Narinun is that um uh, she she ran in from the from the desert side into mm -hmm. Rangers country from Gija into Narinun country and stole the kind of the the fruit of communal labor if you like of all the all the um clan animals um so they'd been they collected up uh, these black plums and had ground them into a, you know, into this classic ceremonial bread, and um, and the Jebra ran in and um, and jumped the line, <laughs> broke one and and took off and ran back to the to the to the desert, uh, not that far to Walpuri, but mm, mm, but mm. you know to Gija and uh, and uh, ended up passing away and becoming there's a Gunaninjal hill like a hill. In Gigi country called Emu Hill, um, and uh, there's like Tony Redmond has as, uh, as, uh, discussed this story as kind of a, you know, like a narrowing an account of of kind of you know the this kind of refutation of um, of social relationships and communal labour, um, and. Uh, but then, uh, so Rona Charles, who, uh, who's a Ngarinian scholar and community researcher, um, has also reflected on it with me in the context of um, you know, what happens when a researcher, such as myself, comes in and, and accumulates knowledge in their body and mind and then, and then leaves. And <laughs> how, do we, um, how do we perhaps not be like the Jebra, but, but honour and, and continue to participate in that communal labour? Um, and uh, yeah, and, and and do so with care and, and nurturing. So that that's kind of where where it's gone. Yeah, but, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm really curious, and I know that Wanter in the past has expressed interest in that um, 
you know, those emu stories across further south from Narnan to, mm, mm, mm. to um, Yaru land, but yeah. He's, he's going to try and get up to um, Broome at some point this yeah. year and um, talk. There's that project up there at the Land Council. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know too much about it yet, but um, I think a, a part of his project at the moment at um, University of Melbourne is is tracking this emu song line mm -hmm. uh, and various kangaroo connections in there as well, but, but from Broome right down through to New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I've got from that actually is that it's not so much documenting what is there already, but it's about actually creating something through the coincidences, the symbolic coincidences that might be there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's almost as if where there is a symbolic symbolic coincidence, so an emu in 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 Broome and, and an emu in Warpre country, and then it's a question of asking why is that there, and so the the justification from that comes not from from a framework of 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 justifying that that is um, a legitimate connection that you know we can we can say that there is a a correlation there um, historically or or whatever. The legitimacy of that comes by what it brings about in terms of of the connections and the responsibilities it generates, and that itself is is why it must be there. That's why the ancestors put it there. So it's almost like reversing the whole paradigm of indigenous knowledge as something that we kind of discover or um, encounter within culture. To um, these things become meaningful, and and we recognise their truth in their ongoing efficacy to do this. And and I think that's where I've, that's my interpretation of, of what's going on with this. Um, very well, there might be some, you know, reason that something's been traded across that route and, and there is actually a, a scientific connection there. Um, but it almost doesn't matter if, if we find other EMU connections, well, then let's explore what they are. And that's, I guess that's where Wanda talks about too, um, the EMU in, what, why, are, why are only flightless birds in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, that's because the Southern Cross is over the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. Um, uh, there are those connections there and it's actually our job to, to find them out. And so knowledge is a responsibility of asking these questions um, and, and seeking the connections and relationships in which we can understand those questions. Um, I think I think you'd like to talk more. <laughs> I, I I think um, I mean I I, I don't know war pre stuff really. I my background's in in Yungwamanaka as as you probably know, and um it's it's been quite recently I've come to some of these stories and just over the last eighteen months really, um so I'm really keen to to learn more. I I don't know if I'm I feel like I'm on the right track if it generates some good conversations. Um, but I, I'm very much, you know, feeling around for where this sort of work might go and grow. <laughs> um, I don't want to claim any sort of knowing what I'm doing here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, and I think that's certainly, I mean, from my sort of perspective you know working with Welpri people there's some lots of I mean I think the emu you speak about is actually the one that comes from the Jadiwanpa line is that right the yeah, in the, so. yeah, yeah. so in, on the south side of that the emu sort of becomes incorporated to um but and you know turn, turns into this emu that you're speaking about but um there's also a snake on that one that winds up on the north coast of Australia um, at a place called Snake Bay, of course, because, you know, that's where the snake wound up, even though well pre mob from down south. Ah, no, yeah. no. So there's yeah, lots <laughs> of connections with that Jadiwampa line, I think, particularly um, in, in ex, you know, expanding connections to different places and no one's kind of claiming to know, you know, what's going on in those places, just knowing that there is a connection, you know, through through that in some kind of way. And isn't that the case that often um, when you're out 
own country or doing something, you rediscover some of these things. And, and um, it's almost as if the text is there in the land already to be discovered. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think that, it, um, I mean, I know some of you here have read this example. The seed is also part of that Jadiwan line that winds up in um, eastern Walpuri country and keeps travelling um, north from there as well. It's another kind of link into Jadiwampa that links country further to the east rather than the emu sort of goes over to the west. So, um, yeah, I can well imagine if if one just starts digging into these connections between stories, it would, yeah, expand right across Australia. Um, it will um, be interesting to see. And, and perhaps we can have him talk about some yeah, of this yeah. another time. Yeah, once he's done that. Um, are there any more questions before... Um, we finish up um yeah so thanks um well thank you again for coming and presenting on um very interesting topic um and next week Mar mary is here i can see are you still here mary no oh, oh yes you are um we'll be speaking at next month on the i think it's the 13th of april um again so we can look forward forward to that and um yeah, I'll send out a reminder about that. And thanks, Sam, and also say thanks to Wonder and Harry for sharing okay. their knowledge with Wonderful. us today too. Thanks okay. for having me. Thanks. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Bye.